<laughs> Good morning, everyone. For some reason, JoJo can't hear the film right now. Good to see everybody. I looked on our YouTube channel. We haven't put anything up since 2020, so I thought we might as well get the rust off the camera and put something up. Yep. Had a great time at Cookville last week. So anybody that was there that sees this, thanks again for the great, great time last week. It was it was awesome. Um. I gave part of this in Cookville and turned around and made it a little more, but started off with what do politics, the news media, extreme leftist activist group and anti-God protesters all have in common? Well, there's not really too many wrong answers really about anything you say would probably be accurate. We could say, well, a good majority of them are, are liars. A good majority of them are hate-filled and, and those would be accurate. Um, but I guess the most accurate thing other than the one I'm going to lead to is well they all hate Donald Trump that's a good one but what about an attribute that they don't have let's turn to and this is, isn't just the groups I named this is a world epidemic right now this is through the entire world let's turn to Isaiah 57 verse 20 and 21 Isaiah 57, 20 and 21. This is the English Standard Version. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. When we look up on our society today and we look at all of the turmoil that's across the globe right now, can you say there's peace right now? No, I mean there's not. It's, there's not peace here and there's not peace in the world right now. We have powers that be that are putting people against one another. And unfortunately, everybody is so blind, we can't see what these people are doing by stirring up this group against this one, this race against this race. They're just dividing and conquering all for what? To keep power. That's all it's about. When you look at the news and when you look at the world situation, it brings to what Isaiah said, it's like the troubled sea. There's waves going every which direction and there's no sense of calm anywhere. They have one agenda, it seems, and that is to destroy peace and to destroy the good news of the coming kingdom of God and to keep that suppressed and to keep a false gospel going that has no meaning that is not biblical based and a lot of them will use violence to carry out whatever they need to to do now before we think this whole sermon is doom and gloom aren't you glad you was called out of that chaotic mess there is a way in this world to have peace we in this room and a lot who have are going to be seeing this through the internet have found that peace and, and what is it have you think ask yourself this question however long you've been in god's church what would you trade to go back to your old way of life and to be part of this chaotic mess well i tell you what we wouldn't know peace we wouldn't have peace like we have right now we wouldn't have it as chaotic as things are, I don't let it bother me. Does it aggravate me? Yes. But it doesn't trouble me. And why is that? Well, the reason is because I and many others have a peace that Jesus Christ said the world doesn't understand. And it doesn't. Let's turn to John 14, beginning at verse 23. John 14, beginning at verse 23. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And I will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me and does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom for the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. 
Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to my Father, for the Father is greater than I. When we were called and we accepted, we repented of our sins and we were baptized and had hands laid on us, we began a journey that started out a little chaotic, but as we matured, it turns into peace. And why is that? What Jesus Christ just said. What peace do we have? The peace He gives. What peace does the God of this world give? He gives war, famine, sickness, strife, hatred. Through God's Spirit, we have peace in the midst of all of this chaos. We have peace knowing that one day God the Father will send Jesus Christ back to this earth. He will return as a ruling and conquering king and then the restitution of all things will happen. We have peace knowing that so many will finally in that day have the opportunity to hear God's word without the whispering enchanter constantly pulling them away. Don't ever let the chaos of this world trouble you. It can aggravate you. It can make you angry because it should. It's everything is against God. So as he has called out people, it should annoy us. But at the same time, we remember what Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24. See that you are not troubled because all of these things must happen. He was talking to his people, his followers. One day he will rule with a rod of iron and we will witness the throwing down of evil. There's moments in our lives that could seem chaotic. But through God's Spirit and having an unwavering faith, what can we do? We can overcome these situations when they come against us. I want to look at a biblical example of faith and peace overcoming fear. Faith that can bring assurance and bring peace of mind. Very popular story, David and Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 1. And I'm going to read this out of the Christian Standard Bible. I want this to be as plain as it can be. 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 1. The Philistines gathered their forces for war at Soka and Judah and camped between Soka and Azekah. Saul and the men of Israel gathered and camped in the valley of Elah. They lined up for battle in battle formation to face the Philistines. The Philistines were standing on one hill and the Israelites were standing on another with a ravine between them. The champion named Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistines' camp. He was nine feet, nine inches tall. He wore a bronze helmet and a bronze, bronze scale <coughs> armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was bronze armor on his shins and a bronze javelin that was slung between his shoulders. His shaft was like a weaver's beam. The iron point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield bearer was walking in front of him. And he stood and shouted to the Israelite battle formations, Why do you come out to line up the battle formation? He asked, Am I not a Philistine and you are not servants of Saul? Choose one of your men and have him come down against me. If he, fight, if he wins a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, you will be our servants and serve us. The Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man that we can fight each other. And when Saul and all of Israel heard these words from the Philistines, they lost their courage and were terrified. These were supposed to be God's people. They had saw countless miracles. They recounted through their history of countless miracles that God delivered them. But here they were, hiding because of the sheer gigantic man that stood in front of them. There's giants we face today that could cause us to have fear, that could cause us to lose our courage, just like they felt that day. 
we could come up on what seems to be too gigantic of a trial. And we had two choices at that point. We can be like Saul and the Israelites and shake in our boots and hide. Or, as we're going to continue reading, we can have the faith and courage and peace that David had. Let's go to verse 20. So David got up early in the morning, left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up and set out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was marching out in his battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle formation facing each other. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and ran to the battle line. And when he arrived, they, he asked his brothers how they were. While he was yet speaking with them, suddenly the champion Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words, which David heard. When the Israelites saw Goliath, they retreated from him terrified. Previously, an Israelite man had declared, Do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and give him his daughter. The king will make the family of the man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. David spoke to the men who were standing there. What will be done for this man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? whole different attitude, wasn't it? They were scared and you don't hear any reference to God. David wanted to know who this guy was that would dare come out against the armies of the living God. The troops told him about the offer, concluding that will, is what will be done for the man who kills him. David's oldest brother Eliab listened as he spoke to the men and he became angry with him. Why did you come down here, he asked. Why did you leave those few sheep with the wilderness? I know your arrogance and your evil heart. You came down to see the battle. What have I done now, protested David. It was just a question. Then he turned from those beside him and others in front of him and asked about the offer. The people gave him the answer as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, so he had David brought to him. David said to Saul, Don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Saul replied, You can't fight this Philistine. You're just a youth, and he's been a warrior since he was young. David answered Saul, Your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it. I struck it down and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Why? For he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said, Go, and may the Lord be with you. I'm going to skip ahead a little. David, Saul tried to get David to put his armor on, and he couldn't function in it. You know, he wasn't used to wearing it. Verse 39, David told him, he said, I can't walk in these, talking about his shoes. He said, I'm not used to them. And he took them off. Instead, he took his staff, in verse 40, and chose five smooth stones from the creek and put them in his pouch in his shepherd's bag, and then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistine came closer to David with the shield bearer in front of him, and when the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a youth, healthy, and handsome. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come with me against me with sticks? Then he cursed David by his gods. So we should be seeing a theme here. You have somebody representing the God of Israel who looks insignificant. And then we have this gigantic beast of a man who is representing the God of this world. The fake, the fake pagan gods that are still so popular today for some reason. Verse 44. Come here, the Philistine called to David, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. 
David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of Yahweh, the God of the ranks of Israel. You defied him. Today the Eternal will hand you over to me. Today I will strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpses of the Philistines' camps to the bird of the sky and the creatures of the earth. And then the world will know that Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Eternal's, and He will hand you over to us. It's the reason I read that out of that version. It makes it so clear. All of the armies and the mighty men of Israel had no courage. They had no peace. They were shaking. Little young David went out representing the Almighty Creator. He never once wavered. He never once doubted that for one second he was going to die. He looked the Philistine right in his eyes and told him that Almighty is on his side. What faith can we learn from that? I think we can. Can we see why God loved David so much? Mike brought that up, I think, a couple weeks ago. Verse 48. When the Philistine started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. Notice he ran right towards him. He put his hand in the bag and took out a stone and slung it and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. He overpowered the Philistine and killed him without having a sword. So God gave David the victory. David never lost courage and he never lost peace. And that is something that when we look at this chaotic world, it looks right now, if you don't, if you don't know Jesus Christ, it looks like it's an overbearing mountain of evil right now. You can't turn on the news and not see anti-God rhetoric. If you are a Christian, you are condemned immediately in this world. But with faith and courage, we have to keep going forward and never lose the peace that Jesus Christ has given us. There are so many examples we could go through, but for time's sake, that's the only one I could pull today because I wanted to go and also look at how we can keep this peace in our minds. Let's go to 2 Timothy verse, um, chapter 1 and verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. English Standard Version. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel of the power of God. Paul went through a whole lot. And he never lost his faith, his peace, or his courage, did he? He never lost it. Verse 9, Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of our own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to the light through His gospel. God's Spirit gives us power and not fear. It gives us love and not self-control. Through His Spirit and these attributes, what will that naturally produce in our minds? Peace. It will give us peace. Even when the weight of the world's on us and we want to punch a hole through the wall, when we settle down and think about things, it still gives us peace when we start thinking about what is to come. I told them in Cookville, when we don't let the cares of the world get us down, and, and there's a reason for that. It's a real simple phrase, we win. We win. 
It looks dark right now. But here's the thing. Jesus Christ told us it would be. It's, it should, Dave is so famous for quoting, it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us when these things happen. I'm going to be honest with you, some of it has gotten so, so much of a debauchery, sometimes it does take me off guard when you look at it and you think, how can people do what they do? But I remember that one day, we win. One day we win. <clears throat> we have to keep God's Spirit burning with all power in our lives. Paul told us, I think it was in this chapter, to keep the flame burning, to keep the what to wave it. In other words, keep the air blowing on it, keep the flame hot. Because we need that in this world right now. And there's attributes we can apply to our lives that will give us peace every day. Because if we apply these, we're going to start finding that we think of others instead of ourselves. We'll find that we'll think of serving, serving God's church more than serving self-interest that could just lead us down a bad path or something. We'll learn that we'll have peace and joy because we stop and we think about what if the whole world, and one day it will, what if the whole world lived by these? We know these well in this room. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 12 through 23. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. And what to say, be at peace among yourselves. We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. See that no one, no one, um, no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What great words. What if the whole world lived like that? Can you imagine what a paradise well, us in this room can imagine that paradise. Those in God's church can imagine it because we know one day it will come. But let's add just a little more, a little more ingredients to this recipe. There's a recipe for peace, <coughs> recipe for living a godly life that will give us that peace. If we do this through our daily lives, we will find that the Spirit will not be hindered, but will indeed continue to burn brighter. We know these well. And we also, also in these, it will tell us what will kill the flame of the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, the Christian Standard Bible. Galatians 5, verse 16. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you cert will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. How many have misinterpreted that verse? When we look at what it just said, the flesh desires what is against the Spirit. We go back to the raging sea of this world. What is the main problem? They want everything done their own way. They want to tell God how He is to be worshipped. They want to tell God exactly how He's wrong. We're allowed to do this and we're allowed to do that and you will accept it because we say it's good. But God Almighty tells us that if you have God's Spirit, you won't pursue those things. You'll pursue what is good. Let's see if this sounds like the world. Verse 19. The works of the flesh are obvious. 
sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and with anything similar. I am warning you about these things I warned you before, and listen, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's the recipe of why the world doesn't have peace. It's because they chase these things instead of chasing verse 22 the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. The law is not against such things. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. We apply these teachings to our lives. Anyone who is listening, who is looking for to serve God, if you will start applying these to your life, you will notice things will change. Your life will become more peaceful. Whenever you do get aggravated and, and things come against you and sometimes you will all of a sudden feel like there's no hope, it'll ring a bell in your mind and those feelings will start to go back away because you start thinking about this instead of what Satan wants you to think about. That's the power of God's Spirit in our minds. To guide, to direct us, to teach us, and to give us peace. We'll still deal with trials and tribulations. I'm not trying to tell anyone you'll never experience stress in your life. That would not be the truth. The Bible never promises that. It gives us peace of mind knowing the outcome that when we see the all of this happening on this planet, all of the chaos, all of the war, all the sexual immorality, all of the hatred, all of the politicians and stuff keeping different races of people mad at each other when there's no reason for that, then we know the outcome. We know one day that will be stopped. And how we look forward to that day, and that is our ultimate peace, knowing that one day Jesus Christ will return as King of Kings, rule with a rod of iron, and eternity is as far as we'll go. And now for our next speaker... Mr. Mike Partridge. The old lady said so. There's a joke about the old lady. Thank you, Chris. Wonderful words. Thank you so much. Brother, it's good to be here with you. This message is for not only our called out ones, God's first fruits, but also for people that hear our words and realize there's something wrong and they want to change. They want to change. To all that have been called into God's church, we see very clearly <clears throat> the destruction of this great land. We see what's coming, don't we? It's very obvious. Um, to all of God's first fruits, pray like you've never prayed before. Search the scriptures daily. Grow in grace and knowledge. Draw closer to God and closer to Christ. The latter days are upon us, brother. You can see it, and so can I. So can I. Let's go to Jude. Jude 15. Jude 15. Jude 15. Okay. Let's start up here. To execute judgment upon all, to convince all that of their ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, all their hard speeches, it says, 
which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. There will be murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of the advantage. In 18 it says, They told you that mockers in the last days would be among us, walking after their own ungodly lust. Do we not see it? We absolutely do. We absolutely do. But it goes on to say, Beloved, build up yourselves, your most holy faith, praying, praying in the Holy Spirit. Like Chris was saying, the Holy Spirit. I have more to say about that in a minute. That's that mind of Christ that he will give us, that will give you the overcome, give you the power to overcome and to fight this world. It's Satan's world that we live in for right now. Let's read on. Keep yourselves in the love of God in 21, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ until eternal life. Is that not great? Absolutely. Go with me to 2 Peter now. 2 Peter 3. Okay. This book is full of warnings for all of us. Full of warnings of what's coming. 2 Peter 3. Let's pick it up. 2 Peter 3. The day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night when the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent fire and fervent heat and all the works shall be burned up. Brethren, there's warnings in here to us and to our people and to the nations of what's coming. Of what's coming. It also says in here, there will be mockers and scoffers coming on this earth that will make fun of God. Are we there? Yes, we are. We are there. We are there. We are in the last days. We really are. We are surrounded, brother, by a country with no morals, no law and order. Nothing. Prayer has been removed from school. Marriage is not sacred anymore between a man and a woman. It's not sacred. Anything goes, right, brother? Anything goes. Our government is corrupt. They don't care even if you know that they're corrupt. They just want power. They want power. Transgenderism is taught at a very early age to our youth. Let me say this. As ministers, we are just here to warn. Do not fear us. We have no power. We have no power whatsoever. You must fear what is to come from the heavens. The great king is coming. Read Revelation. It would scare you. If you really get into it, it might even straighten you up. Ministers are just here to warn, to tell you what's coming. And hopefully you'll change with that. You'll change. And that's what we want. That's what we want. We now have terrorists that have been led into our country, waiting to attack. We are going to be destroyed from within. It's very obvious, brother. These are just things I'm bringing to you, hopefully to help change your mind, to see where we're at in prophecy, and see how close we are as a country of being destroyed. God and Jesus Christ, that's right, Chris. God and Jesus Christ are our only hope, our only hope. I just put a little side note in here. That's a little prayer as I was putting this together. Come quickly, Lord, and save us all. Come quickly and save this world. Come quickly and set up your great kingdom where there will be no end, no end. Not only is our government corrupt, the populations of this world are embracing evil. They are embracing evil. Looked up a couple articles, and I won't. I'll just give you two, but there are thousands, right, brethren? Thousands. This is about the Commonwealth Games in England, the opening ceremony. They had a fiery beast in the form of a bull, glowing red eyes, worshipped by enslaved women. Sounds like something right out of Revelation, doesn't it? 
Well, sure it does. Okay? They were ruled over by Roman guard. A Roman guard. And then a woman jumped on the beast and rode it. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? And the flags of many nations worshipped this image. They were all swinging them around, worshipping it. See what's coming, brother? See what's coming. And in behind that, the Tower of Babel grew to a particular height. It grew. Right out of the Bible. Right out of the Bible, what's coming? That same year, another example. That same year, the Grammy Awards, a song entitled Unholy, won the Grammy. It was performed by a homosexual or a gen gen she termed herself a gender queer or a transgender. I will say no more. And there again, in this world, the land of the free, you can do what you want. Do not fear us. We have no power. We will, we're just here to bring you words and tell you what's going to happen. You must fear Jesus Christ and this great creator being that's coming back. Fear him. Not us. Not us. I will say no more. Yes, the next song won a Grammy titled Unholy. To our government. They have opened the doors to, for Satan to come in our government, the very doors. I've told, this, I've, I've told this story before to the churches. On January 3rd, the opening prayer for the newly elected Congress. Okay, It was not a prayer to the God of Abraham, our founding fathers in Thanksgiving. No, it was a prayer to the God of Abram, a Hindu pagan God. Is who they pray to. It was done by a Missouri congressman. No names mentioned. What is wrong with our government? What is wrong? You have opened the doors to demons you un unbelieve, unbelievable. You have opened those doors. God has left your house anytime you go into transgenderism and the mutilation of young children. God has left your house. It was a Hindu God known by many different names and many different faiths. And they said, let it be done. So brother, you see what's on the horizon for our country and the world? Steeped in paganism? You see what's on the horizon? I beg everyone, for the, especially the first fruits, pray like you've never prayed before, stay close to God. But to the ones that see how evil and may have questions about what they've been taught, please give us a call. We would love to help. There is a true God out there. There is a true day to worship. A true day to worship. There's great prophecy in this book. There's great peace that Chris has told us about if you follow him. Great peace. We have wonderful peace here, don't we? Wonderful peace among the brethren. We enjoy each other. We love each other. We try to develop good fruits. We fall, but we pick each other up. And that's what we should do. Pick each other up. These two comments, brother, is the world that we live in and the country that we have now. I'm so saddened by it. So saddened. Revelation 18.4. Let's go there. Revelation 18.4. This is a warning and a plea and a cry for not only, it's, it's for all people, but for us too to really write it in our hearts and minds. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Come out of her. Be you not partakers of her sins that you received not of her plagues. And those plagues are coming. The downfall of this country is coming. Jacob's trouble is coming on this country. Don't laugh, because the Bible is true, if you are laughing. Oh, that's been said for years and years. 
Yes, brother, and it may, may have been said and preached to you years and years, but it is a warning. And there are certain signs you have to watch for. You have to watch for and look. And they are out there. Not only our weather, uh, signs in the Middle East, war in the Middle East, watch for that. Watch for a great beast superpower out of Europe, watch for that. We can go on and on, but it's coming. It's coming to an end. His millennial reign, the millennial reign of Christ, is gonna be something to behold. There'll be no wars, there'll be no more hatred. Peace and prosperity for all. God's laws will be taught, will be taught. What a wonderful life it will be. We experience that now in God's church, in God's true church. We experience that. You can too. You can too. Chris has got everything uploaded, I think, on our, our web page, but give us a call if you have any questions. We are here to help. We are here to help. Within this book are found many truths. Just give you a few of them. The correct day to worship, which was instituted at creation, has anything to do with being Jewish. The seventh day Sabbath, Friday evening to Saturday evening. When that sun goes down, you can shut off the world and enjoy such great peace. You can get out of the rat race. When we drive to church, it's like we got about a half hour where it seems like we're driving. I told my daughter at Talladega, it's bumper to bumper coming through Evansville. Six inches off each other's bumper and there they go. But then we get into the, the countryside of Kentucky and it's just as peaceful and happy. We can slow down. Within this book are found many great truths. The holy days are to be kept, rich in meaning, telling about God's great master plan okay, for mankind. We have the Passover coming up, a time when we wash our brother's feet with humility. It's one of the most so one of the greatest ceremonies that is heartfelt and you will never forget. Never forget. We have the days of unleavened bread, rich in meaning. When you die, you go to sleep. Another great truth. You don't fly off to heaven and float around on the clouds and play a harp. You don't do that, brother. You go to sleep and you wait for the resurrections, depending on where you're at. Okay, spoken of in Revelation. Another great truth, Christ will return to the earth to set up his kingdom. Oh Lord, and I'll say it again, oh Lord, come quickly. Come quickly. If you hear my voice and you have questions about what you've been taught, maybe God is calling. John 6, 44, let's go there. Familiar scripture, but it's, it's a good one. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. You know, God has many tools to get a hold of your attention. It could be books, it could be CDs, it could be warnings or messages from his ministers that may strike your heart where you want to know more, where you want to know more. Please, brethren, if you do have those questions, get a hold of us. You can get prepared for what's coming. There's great protection in the word of Christ, great protection. He says he will never leave us and he will give his angels charge over us, his people, his first fruits. First fruits. Your calling is a divine summons. A divine summons to come out of this world and to learn God's real truth. That's what it is. I first heard a message when I was about 17 years old from Mr. Armstrong on a radio program. And it said, 
Are you ready for a world tomorrow coming to this earth? Brother, I was raised in a mainstream, mainstream religious church, the biggest, where I was told that I may have to go to purgatory for a little while and just maybe sizzle or burn there just a little bit before I could go on up. I thought this message is totally different from what I've been told. Totally different. I started listening. Boy, the seventh day Sabbath was kept to be kept. The holy days were to be kept. To be kept. And before you know it, you think about baptism. You want to be baptized and you don't want to go back into this world. You want to make that commitment to change and that's what it is. True heartfelt change. That's what it is. And there's no, no better turn to make in your life when you're at the crossroads than to turn to this book and the real Jesus Christ. Go on with it. Don't be afraid. The Holy Spirit will give you power, will give you power to overcome and strengthen and settle you to be determined to make it to the end. And it will grow within you over a period of time. It really will. The Holy Spirit. I thought, whom does God call? Because as I was going through this, I thought, I've been in the landscape business all my life. I've been on my knees. I've laid irrigation lines. I've put in stonework. And all I've basically done was play in the dirt all my life. 1 Corinthians. Let's go there. Okay? 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. Okay? First Corinthians 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brother, and it is a calling. You get that summons, that question put in your mind uh, that something's wrong in this world and you want to know something different. You want to change. Your calling, brethren, not many wise men after the flesh. All of us could probably say that. Not many mighty, not many noble men are called. Have any of our government leaders been called? Have any of our presidents? They've had good godly character, some of them, but they've never been called into God's true Sabbath. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak to confound the things which are mighty. That's us. That's us. He's chosen the base things of the world, things which are despised. God has chosen us. Okay? And the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Are. What's it say then? No flesh should glory in his presence. We must always deal in humility and humbleness before God and respect him for what he's done in our life. But of him you are Christ, whom of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, it says, and redemption. We've been forgiven. There's great forgiveness in God's truth. Great forgiveness. He that glories, let him glory in the Lord. In the Lord. Okay? Real forgiveness in God's truth. Let's go to Acts 2 now. This is kind of the main theme I want to get to, brother and friends out there. If you have questions, it's very easy. Acts 2. Okay? Listen to what Peter said at the time of Pentecost. What Peter said. Verse 38. 2 verse 38. Repent. Be baptized every one of you in the name of Christ for the remissions of sins. And you shall receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Are you sorry what you, for what you've done, what you've been? If you are, think about coming to Christ. Think about coming to Christ through baptism. If you're truly sorrowful, your sins will be forgiven. Will be forgiven. Let's read on. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Is he calling you? 
Think about it, brother. And he may be calling you to come out of this world that we just discussed earlier, that Chris discussed. He may be calling you to do that. It's much better on this side, brother. It really is. It's much better. It's much better with God's truth to live like this. To have one wife who's your friend and, and you do things with. To have a child that you raise properly. And don't teach him about transgenderism or the mutilation, what they can go through. God has removed his hand from our government. Removed his hand. 40 says, and with many other words did he testify, Peter did. And he exhorted. What's he say? Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Does that not fit our times? Absolutely it does. Crooked generation. And there again, world and our country, our government, you don't have to fear us. We have no power. You must fear what's coming. We will all stand before our Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us will. You will, I will, and we will give an account of our life. Think about that. We will give an account. Through baptism and keeping God's true laws, you are coming out of this world. Okay? And the Lord beseeches us to do that once He's planted that little thought, that little seed. Through baptism, we bury the old sinful man in a watery grave. Okay? Completely submerged, you rise out refreshed and clean. Ready to start your journey with Christ. One of peace. One of peace and happiness. Because you know this world is not going to last and there's a better world coming. You have hope. Great hope. Okay? From this calling and through baptism, your eyes will be opened more and more to God's great truth. You will have great understanding. Great understanding. The Holy Spirit will be given to you and it will help you overcome and strengthen you so that you can resist all evils around you. All evils. And that's what we're surrounded by this day. Romans 8. A few readings in there. Romans 8. This is about God's Holy Spirit and the carnality of man. God's Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh, they do mind the things of the flesh. But after the Spirit, you will mind things of the Spirit. That's what will happen to you once you go under those waters of baptism. You will feel great. You will want, you will want to start a new walk, a new way of life, a new direction. I did. I did. Boy, I felt great. All the congregation out here, I know they can say the same thing. They felt wonderful when they come out of the waters. For to be carnally minded is death, spiritually minded is life and peace. The carnal mind is empty against God. It's not subject to the law, but the, the Spirit. You mind things of the Spirit. You seek after the Spirit. You seek to please God then. You seek to walk righteously and to do things right. That old man is gone. It's been buried. And there you are. You're ready to start on your journey, brother. On your journey. The Holy Spirit will grow within you in strength and knowledge over time. It will. If you hear my voice and have a question mark about your purpose and your destiny, please, think about baptism. Think about changing your way of life. Your diff a different way of walking. A different path. A different footsteps. Think about that. Psalm 103. Let's go there. Psalm 103. A few readings out of Psalm 103. I thought it was very good and it deals with this subject. But again, with verse 1 has a nice has a nice ring to it. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, and we should. Okay? 
who forgives all thy iniquities, who heals all our diseases, it says, who redeemed thy life from destruction or the grave, who crowned thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. That's his plan. One day, brethren, all people will have a chance to live, but God's first fruits will be kings and priests on this earth. And you have a chance to be part of that. You will give a thousand years on your friends or relatives if you come to the walk of Christ and his truth. A thousand years you will gain. You will be able to really help people and make a difference in, in this world. Wouldn't you like that? We do. We love it here. We love it here. The Lord will execute judgment and righteousness for all that are oppressed, it says. He'll do all that. He's made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. He's made his acts and ways known to us here. And he will tell you the same thing and show you the same thing. He is merciful, he's gracious, he's slow to anger, and he's full of mercy. And he is. He's also full of forgiveness. You will be forgiven. And you will feel great. You can start that new journey. Nine is interesting. He will not keep his anger forever. Some of our forefathers said that. I can't remember if it was Thomas Jefferson or whom. But he said, we serve a just God. I, one of them. We serve a just God. But he will not hold his justice forever. And we can see that, brother, on the horizon. We really can. Yeah. Okay? He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our inequities. What's he say? For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Okay? As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions, our sins from us. Dave and I talk about this a lot. Thank God he's removed our sins from us. Amen. Baptism allows you to move forward with a divine purpose. God and Christ are open to your prayers. They will hear them. They will hear them. Making that commitment to baptism and serving the real God will remove all fear from, your, from inside of you. The Spirit will give you strength beyond belief. You're getting part of the mind of Jesus Christ, the Almighty God. And you want to serve them more and more each day. And you understand God's great plan. To God's called out, we must continue steadfast in prayer, study, and loving one another. And loving one another. To those who hear my voice and want to come out of this evil world, please give us a call. We're here to help. Most of all, your Father is there to help. Almighty God and Jesus Christ, they're here to help also. In conclusion, let me say this. These words that Chris and I have given you today, we hope that they help you. And there again, brother, we are just ministers bringing a word to you. We're warning you according to God's, what we're commanded to do, to warn. So we have no power, but fear what is coming, brother. And please, call us if you want that change. We're here to help. God bless you all till we meet again.